Uh, so we're going to start our panel. Very excited for this VFX panel. Um, as part of the collective, we have been really encouraging production designers to, um, to kind of deepen their involvement with um, digital visual effects. As we all know, in the last 20 years or so, digital visual effects have really um, moved very, very fast. Um, to be an uh, essential part of the production design universe. And um, we're always thrilled to talk to production designers who have advanced in their um, collaboration with VFX department or in their own um, engagement with visual effects. So we're thrilled to have our panelists today who are going to tell us a little bit about their experience and show us some case studies of their um, visual effects involvement. So I'm just going to start by asking each one of our panelists to tell us a little bit about their career path and how it led them to being engaged in visual effects. Hi. Um, before I do that, I've been trying to figure out how to say this to everybody because I'm I feel like I'm levitating a bit, so forgive me if I like start crying or something. But, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I just wanted to say to Imbal how um, I just can't believe, I keep saying to her, I can't believe that this is actually happening. Imbal um, and I had a Zoom. I was in London in March uh, at the end of COVID lockdown in the rain all alone. And Imbal was zooming me from Northern Ireland in a cottage in the rain, in the dark. And, and we were talking about this event and saying, you know, where might it be and, and, and our excitement about it. And to be here and to see what you've accomplished and um, the incredible organization, I'm just so mind blown and <laughs> grateful. And, and to take that a step further, I felt like I wanted to tell, share a story with you that I hope isn't too dark, because this has been such a happy time, but it, I promise it has an uplifting ending, but it's something I've been trying to work through, so I'll just share it with you. Um, but uh, I, I had this, exp I just finished the Batman, three years of intense work through COVID, and um, I had been sort of like looking to the premiere as this sort of like destination, you know, like this is it, like I'll have done it and like I'll have this moment on the carpet and, and um, anyway, so I made it through the film and I got to the carpet and uh, I actually had to fight my way onto the carpet, I wasn't invited, I had to push through the, <laughs> through the police to get to the space and I got to the head of the line and I was talking to some of the actors and I went to the publicist and I said, I'm going to walk, walk the photo line. And she looked at me and she was like, no one cares about you here. <laughs> and, uh, and it was surreal, you know, because I'd gotten to this point that my whole career had been building to and I had this response. But I feel like there was a takeaway for me, like it was a, a real moment to recognize that um, you know, there are two responses, I guess. Like, one is very Buddhist, and the other might be a little more honest, you know. And the Buddhist response is, like, it's all about the journey, which I really do believe. I think all the work that we invest in our careers, and like the conversation yesterday about how to build a great art department, and um, Rick's comment about the believers, you know, I think, like, um, so much of that is true. I think we really we as a group and it's been so interesting to see the psychological profiles of all of us and how they line up i think we spend a lot of time taking care of other people and nurturing the creative flame of the film is like part of what we do so i think we spend a lot of time looking out and and at that moment i was like well that's it i mean you actually get to the pinnacle and you realize like the room is empty, it doesn't matter. It's not about that place. It's not about the photo or the red carpet or any of that. It's about what happened before and the people you work with and the team that got you there. And so that really hit for me at that time. But 
I think the second, the second feeling was we have work to do as production designers to raise our profile and, uh, and help people understand who we are and what we do. I think we are, this is like hopefully the beginning of many gatherings and uh, I feel like we really need to draw strength from each other and organize and um, this is the first time I've been in a place where I could see so many of us together and talk to my heroes and students and the mix is amazing. So I look forward to more of this. So about me and visual effects. Um, what was the question? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your path. I mean, uh, I started in uh, independent film in New York. Uh, you know, I was a carpenter. I was very analog. And, um, you know, I started on indie film and I had an amazing analog rise. And, um, and uh, I've seen the progression of the tools along the way. I had a bit of a pause in the middle of my career and like suddenly was slingshot back into the world on Avengers. And uh, so I've really been excited to see the progression of digital tools and, um, and uh, you know, the la it's been a real ladder the last few movies I've worked on. Um, Planet of the Apes obviously was like fully digital characters and digital backgrounds and Lion King, um, we shot the whole movie in virtual reality, so I feel like, um, anyway, I look forward to sharing more about that, but that's my path. Okay, my turn. Um, thanks for that beautiful introduction, James, plus one. <laughs> um, nothing to add. Um, yeah, my path to, to that career or my beginning was a bit odd to put it that way. Um, I, I came from photography. I always wanted to do film, but I somehow ended in photography, and then I changed for design, and I studied design in a very general way, so product design, com communicational design, um, visuals in general, and uh, I worked as a director for uh, music videos and smaller commercials. And um, during the studies, I um, had to earn a bit of money because music videos uh, didn't pay, my, uh, pay what I needed, unfortunately. So I had to uh, work as an AC for documentaries. And um, then somehow I found my way back to, to movies and um, I worked as an AD for two uh, features. And this was the first time I realized there's something like production design. Uh, and I was so happy finally to find this. Um, but I guess this very odd way explains maybe my take on, um, on VFX and my angle on it because I worked in different fields and I was so used to, to have different tools. So, you know, when, when I as an AC or editing my own stuff and whatever I always had to do with um, VFX. And also, as you might know and hopefully see, I'm a bit of this younger generation of filmmakers. And so VFX has always been around. I um, grew up with VFX. There was no question. When I um, attended the film school, the um, film academy in Germany, they always had a strong focus on VFX. So. Already these very short, low-budget movies we did on film school had a big focus on VFX. It was always there. It was just a tool, and this was my angle on it. I just tried to use VFX as a tool and not as something that could be competitive. So I didn't thought, okay, this is something that takes away some work from me. It was more like, oh, it has a big chance for me. There's VFX. I can enhance my sets because I don't have the money to build it. And so I tried to understand VFX and to use it as a tool. That's basically my way into it. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, so 
I came about came to this industry through construction, architecture, furniture building, so a very practical, um, hands-on approach to design. And I think before coming into the film industry, my impression of visual effects was always a bit, um, I was always disappointed, I think, with a lot of what we've talked about, a lot of people have talked about on these panels are rules, the, the confines of um, design and the parameters through which we, we work. And it felt like the visual effects department didn't get the memo about rules. Um, and so there was a lot of defined scale um, physics. There's all sorts of things that as a viewer, I found really distracting. And, um, and I think that the amazing thing about the medium of film is that it's a collaborative art. We work with dozens of other departments, hundreds of other people. We're not the, the lone cowboy. You know, we have to collaborate. And so when you have an element of a, of a movie or a television show that takes you so far out of it because it's, it didn't follow the rules, um, I, I, it made me a little angry. And um, so coming up in art departments, doing set design and art direction and working on some larger shows where there was a, a, a lot of visual effects um, incorpor incorporated into those shows. Um, I came up in a time when there was a very antagonizing relationship between the VFX department or previs and um, the art department. And I think there was a lot of that resentment that I just expressed was coming from the art department. It was like, you know, most set designers are architects or come from, from that world. And a lot of people in visual effects are coming from gaming or, or, or other backgrounds that don't necessarily have that um, background in reality, in authenticity. And um, when I started designing, I carried that, that kind of, um, I had my guard up about them. You know, there's, I, I was apprehensive about working with teams and most of the design work I was, I've been doing for the last several years has been period, um, kind of large scale period television. And um, what I quickly learned was if I kept that guard up, then I was neglecting a major asset and a major tool. And if I could figure out a way to bring them into under my wing and, and make it a collaborative process where we were trying to engage and share that experience that came from our department, that I'd be much happier with the end result. And so, um, you know, as we go on today and we show our pre presentations, I'm gonna focus on what those tools that we have are to um, ingratiate ourselves with them and incorporate their work into our world in a way that makes us happy. So we're gonna jump into some uh, images and talk through them, um, if we can turn down the light. Starting with James. Um, gosh, I spent so much time on the opening statement. I'm gonna have to get up to speed on this part, but um, I think uh, I'm gonna take you through some images. I think it was interesting, you know, hearing Mara talk. I think uh, my background, I've certainly been very suspicious of visual effects as like a solution. I think it makes for lazy filmmaking on the whole, and I think we all experienced that in different ways in the 90s as it was breaking out, you know. I think um, the real thrust of the presentation that I think what I'm hoping you'll see is that I think we're reaching a tipping point in our industry where, um, as I describe it, I think there was a time when, as production designers, we controlled everything in the image. I think, um, you know, with the advent of digital visual effects and CG, like um, suddenly there were corporations that could have these big computers that we had no access to and a lot of the work that was art department work was farmed out to these big companies and a big piece of our budget got sliced away and, and I think, you know, my generation has grown up, you know, just sort of like looking at a green screen and, and knowing that that belongs to someone else and I think um, what I'm hoping that we realize now is that we can actually control that space, that's our space traditionally. And um, I think, you know, my, my push here with all of us is that we should 
dig into that space and, and work it into our workflow and make sure that like we really do control it. And I think the computers are getting faster and faster and, and the tools are getting more and more robust to the point that what was to, you know, considered a, a painted backing or a miniature, you know, or like a, a, a matte painting on glass effect, you know, I think it's that time again. And I think we need to wake up and really embrace the tools and get into it and take control because I think, you know, the next 10 years we're gonna see this technology getting faster and faster and more and more available. And I think we just, that's our space and, and, and we should reclaim it. So this, this deck is really just kind of showing you um, my, my journey into it. You know, as I said, I worked on some very visual effects heavy movies, but the green screen space was, was an outside thing to me. You know, I mean, I, we can do an illustration and show what we'd like that extension to be, but often, you know, on the movies of the scale that I work on, you know, the, the end of the movie, we're gone and, and they'll just muck around with the image to their heart's content and we really don't have access to that. And so trying to pull that work into prep is what, what, what I'm really trying to do. So, so this, this case study, you know, I was invited to do The Lion King with Jon Favreau and I'm so grateful because it was really just like two years of of university in, in, in the new tools, you know, and uh, his, his ambition was to shoot the whole movie in, in virtual space with virtual cameras, but tracking real cameras on stage to emulate the um, discipline of a live action feel. So um, we motion tracked cameras, we had dolly grips and cranes and all that. Um, in an effort to bring into the CG animation like the feeling of a grounded camera. And uh, um, I thought that was an incredible project and an exciting endeavor. I mean, the fact that it was Lion King was neither here nor there. It was just really an amazing way to experiment and play. Um, so this particular case, I just, we, we, as an art department, we were building the world in in 3D and then we would invite um, the director and the DP into the space using virtual reality goggles. We would all be together scouting space and looking at sets. And then the ambition, the final ambition would be, you know, John would see a layout that we provided and he would give notes. We would stage some characters and then we would bring that to the animation team who would animate the characters in that space and then they would bring it to stage and they would shoot the scene with the actors moving around. So um, pretty mind-blowing stuff. Um, and uh, this is just one example of a set. So uh, in The Lion King, in the original, there's a jungle that is not really, doesn't really exist in, in the area of Kenya that we were exploring and trying to represent. And so I was excited about this area on, the, on, the, on Mount Kenya um, that's called the Cloud Forest. So it's like, a, it's, it, for me it was just exciting because it was a place that um, could feel connected to the rest of the geography we were exploring. And so this is an image from a scout. Um, uh, you know, we went to Kenya and we're exploring the terrain. We used all sorts of tools, um, photogrammetry and, and scanning tools to actually capture a lot of the ge geography you'll see here. And this, this was just, this is when I realized like things were gonna be different. <laughs> um, so we scanned this and then I was working with a really talented illustrator who was like, you know, I could, I could write a script that would, that would populate this mountain with trees and rocks for you and like so, he like designed this script that was like on vertical faces, it would look like rock, and then trees would exist on terrain that's flat enough. I mean, it was incredible. So in two days, we had, we had this geo, and I could go into VR goggles and fly around this mountain scouting for locations. <laughs> and so I would like go and I'd see this little valley with a couple trees and a rock and you know you say oh i could see simba doing the river crossing here or something like that and uh, it was just uh, it was otherworldly to me to realize like 
because I'm come I come from traditional live action. I'm I love scouting, and suddenly I realized like we could do all this in the computer, and what that meant for the future. I just think it's exciting for all of us, you know. So here's us scouting, <laughs> looking super cool, um, and uh, uh, anyway, it, it's like when they invented the wheel or something. I look at this picture like, <laughs> what is going on? Not what I envisioned my future to be in film. Maybe why the red carpet thing happened, I don't know. Um, but uh, so this is just an example of one area. This is the Cloud Forest Reveal, which is where Simba and his friends first arrive at the jungle. And so you're just seeing a combination of tools here that we use. So, you know, again, photogrammetry tools where we went to Kenya and actually scanned the rocks and brought them back. And then obviously those rocks were then brought into the computer and sculptors were touching those rocks and refining them and, you know, making sure the position was right. And this is a paint over on Argeo, a beautiful illustration. Um, leading to um, the final frames um, in render. So um, that was Lion King, and that was an experience that um, I brought forward into, into my work on the Batman. I knew that um, you know Matt Reeves, the director of Batman, and I had done two Lion, uh, Planet of the Apes movies, and he was super immersed in the technology, and I knew that he'd be real really receptive to to the VR um, experience and so early on you know engaged him to say um, I think we should do the whole movie you know all the sets basically my ambition was to build all of Gotham in the Unreal Engine which means like basically as a big video game that you could walk around in uh, together in different ways and so Matt was super supportive and excited about that idea and um, to the point that, um, you know, he basically shot listed the whole movie in, in, in Unreal. Um, and I just think, like, that was when I realized, like, pre and all these things that, that we don't control. Like, I saw the future, you know, that, like, I think if we all can learn these tools and share them with our directors and kind of infect them with the, with the realization that they can experience our sets and locations, before we build them, um, you know, it's a tool that they're going to want. And I think that's going to allow us to start scraping back, you know, from the, from the visual effects um, side, you know, budget and resource, which really is the whole issue. So these are some, this is just a little study, basically, this is the un, unfinished skyscraper, the searchlight tower for, for Batman, and um, um, some early concept dream stuff, um, and then, you know, as we started breaking it down, so many of these scenes take place at dawn or dusk or at night, and as we all know, it's an impossible condition to capture, you know, um, it's a short window and, and uh, time moves, so Greg Frazier had just, he, our cinematographer had just finished, um, you know, his development on the Mandalorian using the LED screens and he was um, a huge champion of those tools and had developed a lot of that language um, with ILM. So we saw an opportunity to build a volume for, for the Batman and, uh, and this was really the prime, um, prime place where it, it was most effective for us. So, and uh, I think, I guess, I'm overwhelmed trying to um, trying to explain you know the 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 layers of it's it's a big onion this thing but I think I guess the the real thing is to say um, we used it as you would use a traditional backing like this set is very traditional in the sense that the the set doesn't meet the volume um, you know it's a the screen is there and and there's a separation so on Mandalorian a lot of the sets would run into the screen and that was like that's a whole math problem that uh, we didn't have to deal with but it does speak to some of the issues that I was saying so so we built a rough model of the um, 
of the city in, um, this shows you the set and the volume construction. But I think as we were trying to figure out the content of this screen, it's like, how do we, how do we design this city? And uh, early on, we realized that similar to Lion King, it would be good to actually find a, you know, find a spot in a real city that we could use and then enhance it. Um, uh, so we found a place in New York that we used and flipped. So this is an area in downtown New York. And this shows some process where, again, we took some, some Google Earth and, uh, and some scans and brought them in uh, and then started to illustrate on them and showed like what they could be and showed them in the set. Uh, and this shows, this is actually, this is a frame from the Unreal model that we built. So, so you're seeing the process of uh, rough modeling into illustration and then development into, um, into Unreal. So this is like a raw image panning around of the background that we were ultimately going to be playing on the, on the volume screen. And you're seeing here some illustration over that Unreal as we're trying to communicate with ILM and explain like what we, what we want it to finally look like. And this is really the crux of the control issues that I was speaking of saying like, you know, we can take the model to a certain place within our team, but then at a certain point we hand the baton to a big company that we can't really uh, connect with. And I think I'm looking forward to the Epic pre presentation later today. I think like, the tools are getting better and better, and I think ultimately this crude model that you see here will hopefully be more and more photoreal as we go along, and um, I think that'll allow us the opportunity to finish our thoughts, really. Um, so here's some more process. Here's showing some photographs from the city, and then paint overs, you know, changes, and these would really help guide our model modelers in terms of developing the assets for the screen. And this is like rough Unreal illustration and then, uh, and then model. And then this is the final shot in the movie. So it was amazing, you know, seeing, um, seeing Matt work in here. I mean, he really grabbed onto it with both hands. We had um, camera tools that would allow him to hold like a joystick controller and and lens like you know with the actual lens information Greg Frazier could come in and do lighting adjustments and I mean it's just like I feel like once you actually get into the system you realize like um, where it's going to take us you know uh, whether or not we actually use the LED screens I think just as a tool generally for our department is something that we should we should really um, embrace so this is another usage this is showing the cemetery scene at the end of the movie. Again, pretty traditional in terms of the fact that it was like a parapet set, um, like overlooking the back, the city. Um, so we could really um, achieve like uh, separation from the screen and soft focus and things like that. And the back cave, um, I just, I guess here I just wanted to show um, a more traditional approach in terms of like early illustration on 3D and then this was a, a 3D printed model that we made um, and then this is the Unreal version. So this is what Matt was storyboarding on. This is where we spent our time sort of planning the scenes. And this is the final set um, showing the set extension space. And this is just another example. This is the Unreal um, model of a piece of our back lot that was the Catwoman's apartment. And again, you see the level of detail is pretty high. I mean, I think we kept coming back to the model and improving it. And uh, there was a tracking shot that took place in this set that, you know, Catwoman walks up the stair, goes through the front door, tracks all the way through the apartment, out her window, and drops back down. So. Um, you know, it was an invaluable tool as we were using very precise lenses, trying to make sure that the shot was was going to work. And 
And it was, you know, so we built to the Unreal model and it was incredible to see, you know, how accurate it wound up being for us that Matt showed up on that rooftop on the night and everything was there as it needed to be. So um, just one example of, uh, you know, how valuable the tool can be. And that's my deck. This is um, very impressive. Um, presenting something after the Lion King and the Batman is uh, quite a tough thing to do. Um, I have a question for you, if it gets yeah. just, you know, um, uh, regarding the LED walls, because the last two shows we had facing similar uh, problems or tasks, and every time, especially because our projects um, from a European uh, point of view don't have that kind of budget, and we could never, it, the shot count has never been enough at the end to justify such a huge LED wall. So we went back to whatever we could find, try to avoid green, we used soft drops. And my question is, have you ever considered a soft drop for this case, or was it clear from the very beginning that the advantage of an LED wall is so massive that you go for this? When you say soft drop, you mean backing? Yes, a backing. Um, well, I think, again, I think part of this whole, my, the thrust of my talk is like, I think, I th I'm trying to, I'm trying to inspire us all to use some opportunities. I, I've heard from so many people here that people say, you know, oh my God, I was on this show and the producers wanted me to use the LED wall and like, and then we went down the road a certain degree and then we realized it was too expensive and too slow. And I think that's all true. I mean, it's really slow and really expensive and, um, at the same time though, I think there's like, I think we should use that energy that's being presented to us to build a more robust art department and, and reach for more team and more personnel to support that dream of the producers, which if it was, if we had a bigger team and if we could produce the, the material for the screen in a timely way, it's an amazing tool. I mean, and, and the screens are expensive and cumbersome, but that's gonna change. I mean, I think it's gonna, I think it's all gonna be moving faster and faster. So I think just getting in the habit of taking advantage of that hope that the producer has as they enter your office and ask you that question and, and using it to leverage more resource for our teams, I think is really important. But to answer your question, I mean, I think Greg Frazier is, he, he's thrilled, you know, I mean, he's just incredibly passionate about the screen as a light source. And so I think what we were, what we were really doing was providing a lamp for Greg. And I think in the end, you know, I mean, the LED screens are an imperfect product at the moment. And a lot of it was touched in post and enhanced and fixed, you know, so. It's not a one for one, but I think if you have a DP that is gonna to go to war for the fact that they need the light, then, then that's the battle, you know, and, uh, and a backing can't give you that, and green screen certainly can't. If, if I could jump in just for a second, because I think um, producers love to have catchphrases and solutions for things that sometimes seem completely absurd and you know the fix it and post and we're all like that's the there's no kind of um understanding or a lot of the times about what that means or what what that's going to do to the to everybody in post um but i think one of the things i found of late is after shows like the mandalorian um where i'm you know entering into conversations about doing a a period show television show about 1920s Korean family life and I have a producer saying we're looking into the volume and I'm like okay um, it, there, there's a disconnect I think right now between an understanding of what the volume is capable of or, or the LED screens and where it's beneficial and when you, when shows have time and resources and money 
Um, I think it's a, it's a really exciting thing, but I think it's also, we're on the precipice of this kind of like dangerous moment where the producers see it and they're like, we don't have to build any sets. Um, and that is an irrational <laughs> kind of understanding of what the volume can do. And so James, I was, I was hoping you could maybe speak a little bit more to, you talked about kind of mid-ground, foreground, background, but kind of, I think for a lot of people, the volume is this mysterious entity right now. And I think if you could talk a little bit more about how you find it successful when it relates to not necessarily um, uh, a natural environment, you know, you're not in the desert, you're not in those places, but when it actually is, is used for an, uh, a built world where architecture is involved. Um, I mean, I think, I think, I guess I'd say there are levels of complexity. I think when the, when the way we used it, as a, it's essentially a backing. There is no connection to the set. And I think the math is very simple there. We all understand backings and what they need to do and, and the perspective and, you know, our height in relation to the horizon line, all those things are very simple. So I think that, for me, in my first foray into the volume, that's what I was doing. When I look at what Andrew Jones and his team did on, on Mandalorian, I mean, the, the, the complexity ramp is, like, significantly higher where they're having pieces of sets that are interacting with the screen uh, and then when the camera moves they move the set and reconfigure I mean it's just an incredible math puzzle that requires like a whole team to support it so to your point of like time and planning I think like as soon as the set touches the screen it's like a different different animal and I've seen I've seen some amazing examples recently I think like I saw a ballroom set on a, on a Zoom we had earlier um, that, uh, that is almost a landscape where it's like so big that the, the walls are really far away and you're in the middle of a ballroom. There are sets like that that can work similar to nature. I think the idea that you're gonna be able to replace sets with the screens I think um, is terrifying. <laughs> and I mean, I think like for me, I like, you know, um, I love, a, I love building a set, I think, I think um, but I do think it's a puzzle that will get put in our laps more often and as the tools get faster and faster. And um, I think we just are gonna have to figure out how to get on that train. I mean, because I do think, as long as, as, long as the content is being generated by us, I think it's just another tool, you know, I think like, as long as we're in control of the image on the screen, there's really no difference between building a set practically and building a set digitally. I think we just, we're, we're having a problem right now because there aren't enough talented people to go around to support all this desire, you know? But I think, um, like I, th I, th I just, I talk about it like, um, like the model shop, you know? I think like for me, that was always like a really happy place. I love physical models, I love building those. And I've spent so much money on physical models. And I think like ultimately, like that's what it is now. I think the model shop is the Unreal Engine. And I think it's a place that we will go and share with all the teams on the movie. It kind of becomes like the central place. And I think that is where you solve those problems, you know, where you like, and it's very simple because you have the screen and you can, you know, start just breaking down the math. And so, but I just think it's early, you know, it's early and uh, we're kind of ahead of the wave and um, we just need to get on it. Uh, if I can just plug our later session today, um, to those of you who don't know that much about backing, we have a backing, um, program for the students, but also our virtual production session later on is going to show Udo's work, who built the ballroom that we were just discussing, and I think has taken unreal work to a different level. So if you guys are interested in this continuing discussion about virtual production, it will continue today. Great. Um, I'm really looking forward to get into a project where we finally can afford this because I'm so, uh, I really want to use it, um, because what, what you said, um, 
gaining control again and you know having it in the prep of a project um, this is what I'm always trying to do and when I said before I grew up using these tools doesn't mean it satisfied me so actually the first four projects I did um, were a really hard for me at the end um, when you know reality hit me when I saw the results I thought okay this has nothing to do with the world that, world that I created uh, up front and I was wondering at what point I, I, I lost control here and um, sometimes I went to the post uh, to the post um, company and there have been concept artists sitting and I was wondering what these guys are doing because I thought they belonged to my department and um, so um, ever since I tried to I, I, I had two ways to, um, to, to gain control again. The one is I tried to sharpen my vision in the prep as good as I can and to visualize it as good as I can uh, with all the tools we have in the art department and I tried to make myself ir irreplaceable so that in the end when it comes to post-production I will be involved as much as it possible. Uh, I know this is not the normal way, maybe it's not the best way to do it, but for me it has always been the only way to to not lose control, because I didn't have so many tools in the art department or so many possibilities, so I tried to be in the post process. And from project to project I stayed longer and longer, and the last project, uh, the show we just wrapped, I stayed nine months in post-production. Um, just because we produced so much material in the, in, the, in, in the prep that the director and the showrunner both said um, we can't go, we can't do the post-production without the designer because everything has been created on his desk, so let's take him with him. And I would like to, um, to show you just one aspect of this, um, of this project. Um, how is this? Am I just tapping it? No, that's yours. Ah, oh, that's mine. All right. Um, may I just... When I first got the script, um, there's a lot of... It's a script, um, an ecological thriller that takes place all around the globe, so you have to create your world. Um, you have to shoot it in one country, so, of course, you have to do world building that, you know, to, to visualize all these countries. Um, but there have been a few lines in that script, especially the last episodes, is full of it. It's like the HEV, uh, a human-operated vehicle, kind of a submersible, dives down, Charlie looks out, she can see the glow of the water at the surface. Ahead of her, she can see a narrow funnel of year connecting the surface to the deep. Her body floats out of the hatch. All around her, the glowing con concentration of the year. She drifts out into the ocean. The mass moves towards her, wrapping itself around her. Well, um, when I... Um, when I saw this in the script, I was um, super excited because I thought, that's great, it's a, a whole world, a new species to create and to design. And at the same time, I knew this will be a hard fight because this is nothing that I can do. I can build the HEV, I can... That's it, basically. So all the rest <laughs> will go to post-production and I, I, what shall I do? And um, then I discussed it with the line producer um, and I went there and I said, you know, I need quite a bit of a budget to do this. And he said, no, 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 just design the creature, you know, very basic and then we take it from there and we put it to the post. That's great. It's another budget, it's another line producer, that's great. You know, we just have, you know, don't worry. And I said, uh, no, I worry a lot about that because <laughs> I would like to to control this. I would like to design it and um, I won't let go. And so um, this went back and forth, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> took me a few months to, uh, to work this out. Um, first, what I did, um, and this, you know, I'm, I, I tried before even the director did and the showrunner, I tried to explain this, this creature. I tried to explain it's the year is a swarm intelligence. This is all that the, the book gave me. So I tried to explain how it moves, how it works, how it reacts, how, you know, all these questions. Um, and 
the producer was always telling me, no, no, stop. This is nothing that we have to do now. You know, focus on the sets, focus on what we what we're going to shoot. And I, I just didn't stop because I knew I, I, I will lose it. And so I explained it and I gave it to the director and he liked it and the showrunner liked it. And um, then we started to produce um, concept, concept after concept, I guess, more than a hundred of these concepts to explain this world in the abyss. Um, and this is especially what, what I just um, read. These are the, the concepts step by step. Um, from the submersible into the ocean and the girl um, floating around, getting wrapped by this creature. Um, and this is how the year interact with the studio, with the sets that we built. Um, so what I could do then, of course, this, I mean, I could build the obvious, I could build the HUV. So we build the AGV, we build the set around, we build the entire boat and the hatch and everything. And then we shot it. And I only had these concepts and I didn't have any other tool to, to visualize my vision of the year. And I couldn't go for any VR or anything, there was no budget. But I went to the VFX supervisor and the line producer and said, look, you have quite a bit of money there for concepts and previous, so why don't you give me a tiny little bit of this? And I can deliver you my version of how the year will look like. Again, this was a discussion about two months because they said no. Um, the budget was already, already locked, as it uh, is so often. But they gave me a little bit of, of it, and um, that's good. Oh, yeah. And then we thought about the tools we have in the art department, um, and I found an artist in France who's a genius, um, and he works with chemical reactions. I said, okay, this sounds good, you know, um, let's try to do it in camera. And I invited him into the art department and I paid him a little, uh, so, some weeks and we worked on chemical reactions to reproduce what I have concepted before. And these images here, this is not, there's no VFX. This is pure chemical reactions in little petri dishes um, in water tanks in the art department and we recorded it uh, with a um, 4K camera. Um, and um, this was my idea at the end about how it should look like, and this is how we did it. Um, it's a tiny little Petri dish. Um, this is Roman Hill. This is the, the artist who came to the art department. And this is how it looked on screen, and then we just did a little something. Um, let me stop here just for a second. Um, it, it was a way around. So I, I, couldn't, I couldn't afford any expensive tools, so I tried my best to use the tools I have. And I sent this video, it was a video, then a five minute video um, that we edited, and I sent it to the showrunner and the producer. And this was basically my ticket to the post-production. Um, and um, it gave me the opportunity to do a bit more, and um, um, I ended up as the second unit director on the show and shot all the VFX stuff and um, the establisher. And I think this, um, I picked this example just to, to, um, to, to say and to encourage everyone to use every tools you have to gain control on these VFX things, even though the producers say, you yeah, know, just don't touch it, just push it to the post, um, just don't let go. Um, this is my way to do it. Um, so quickly, I have another example, um, which is um, from a feature called Tides, uh, just very quickly, because it, it's the same approach. Um, it's a place in the it's in the future, science fiction. Um, it all takes place in the wetlands. Um, the earth have collapsed. It's an apocalyptic world, and 
uh, when you read the script, you immediately think, okay, this is going to be, we need a big LED wall, we need, um, it's basically a lot of VFX. And I was super lucky to find the best ally you have, it's a DP. Uh, Markus Ferrer um, uh, shot it, and he is also, like me, very keen on, on doing things in camera instead of um, shifting it to the post. And um, I found that the DP is, is really your best ally because also the DP doesn't want to shift it to the post where he loses control. Um, and so we, we went on location first um, for these wetlands um, and we realized this is something because you don't have any room, you can't see any sizes or dimensions in these sets. So we decided not to do it uh, in, in, in post, but to do everything in camera as much as we can. And uh, to build it on stage using a soft drop, so um, a translucent backdrop um, as a background to light the situation. And uh, we started as well with all our tools in the art department to prove that this works. So we built some really small and rough models, super easy, it was like half an hour and it was done. But it proved that this might work. And then we, we, we did bigger models, um, always trying not to shift it to the post. Um, so this was one of the, what, the dam um, that, we had to, that we had to build, which was in the first breakdown, total VFX shot. It was complete VFX shot, so I was out of it, but we tried to, to, to get it back. And then we produced a few, a few concerts, um, which um, hopefully proved that we can do this all in studio um, without any VFX. Uh, that's a dam again. This was the concept uh, that was supposed to be a full CGI, uh, except the, the actor. Um, here you can see quite good the, the above um, picture is location, and then this is on stage. No VFX involved, totally shot on stage. Um, and for, this, uh, for the big, big wide shot, which was supposed to be a full CGI, um, we started to build smaller set pieces, one to five in dimension, um, so a very classic way to do it. And we shot all these set pieces uh, from the same angle, with the same lens from, from a crane, um, used bits and pieces uh, to build up a, um, a, a composite at the end instead of a full CGI. And this is the, the final still we did. So this is partly used model. Uh, you see these small um, parts on the ground of these wetlands. This is all we shot in the studio. And then we just placed it, so placed it together. It's uh, quite a simple, simple way to do it. Um, so I'm here. Only the boat. The boat was something we had to travel a bit to, um, to frame it. And this was the, the, um, the establishing shot at the end, which has been a full CGI in the, in the first breakdown and became a, a composite shot later. And so I could control every piece of it because we built it. Yeah, that was the... One to five, one to five. So I'm going to talk a bit, um, these guys have both talked about visual effects as a tool for world building um, on, a, on a large scale. And what I'm going to talk about is a bit more of visual effects in a supporting role. Um, as I mentioned before, I've done a lot of period television and um, our resources are very different than um, like the projects James talked about in that um, Oftentimes we don't have the scripts in advance. Um, and so mapping out how to achieve the entire series and ahead has to be very loose. Um, and the show I'm gonna talk about um, mainly is The Alienist, which was um, a show based on the books by the same name by Caleb Carr. And it was you know, this very beloved novel about um, 
the investigation of child murders in, in New, New York in the 1890s. And the city plays a very prominent role. There's, uh, you know, these, um, the crime scenes are these iconographic locations in the city. And so it was something that we knew um, the investigation, you know, happens, they're running all around the city in carriages, most of the time open, so we knew there was gonna be a lot of transportation complications because you can see the world in that environment. You don't just get to be in a car um, with the backing outside the window or an LED screen out the window. Um, and we knew that um, it was also a story where, spoiler alert, the killer is moving around on the rooftops. And so, unlike some other period shows where you can get away with building one or two stories and letting visual effects extend the upper levels of the building, we, need, we knew we needed things at full height because of the number of shots that would be looking up and down and, and, and down streets. So I'm gonna show you just um, a few screen grabs from the opening sequence um, of The Alienist. Is it? The middle one. Okay, sorry, there we go. Um, and in the opening sequence, one of the characters um, gets alerted that there's been a murder and he's in Midtown and he goes on this carriage ride um, through the city and ends up um, on the Bowery and makes his way down um, to the construction site of the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, and so he, just in this, the first five minutes <laughs> of the show, it's a, this massive sequence where we knew, we, we just, we had to see a ton of New York in a time period that, you know, this stuff doesn't exist. Um, and he ends up at the base of this construction site of the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, and as you can see in these images, you can see the blue screen and, and kind of where our set ends and, and where visual effects eventually takes over. He climbs up. The, um, to the top of this bridge under construction and eventually finds the first body. Um, so I think, you know, it would be incredible if we, as James mentioned before, if we could, um, if we had the time and resources for every project to build these 3D worlds and to, you know, for every department to have these collaborative conversations about how you move around that space, what's a practical build, what's this, what is set, what's a set, set extension, and all these other things. But the reality of television is those time and resources don't exist. You know, oftentimes um, for a budget less than huge blockbuster movies, you we're essentially making five movies. You know, it's um, 10 hours of television. And so you're, you're, you have to get a lot more bang for your buck. And so our tools of planning, as opposed to um, you know, the unreal 3D um, imaginings of these spaces, ours really come about, especially with historic pieces, with being very um, literal and specific with packages to communicate not with just the art directors and DPs, but with the post team. And so um, one of the first things we did was uh, we mapped out basically every sequence that we knew about from the books or the scripts of what neighborhoods they were going to be traveling in in, in New York City. And um, we looked at extensive construction drawings and references of, you know, the phases of the Williamsburg Bridge and, and all, how, all, how things were being constructed and a lot of back and forth about how much we would build, how much visual effects would build. Um, in our actual backlot, locations, we, we basically, because we knew we had to be in so many neighborhoods in New York, we basically consolidated them instead of being really specific. We, we boil it down to kind of four areas which we built into backlots. So we had the tenements, um, we had what we were calling midtown and then an uptown um, backlot and then the Bowery. And so what we then did is for every scene as they came up in the series, we would um, you know, take the drawings of our back lot and we would modify where the green screen should be used. So whether they were on open-ended streets or if we would truncate the street, but it was basically trying to diversify and make the back lot as dynamic as possible so that we weren't always seeing the same thing. And we were working with visual effects to, to figure out what, where that, those cuts were gonna be. And then we would give them 
these comprehensive packages of the reality of what that um, geography was in New York City. So that when they were extending and post, it wasn't just a generic build, but it was keying into place in a very specific way. Um, and whenever possible, the packages that we would hand over would include um, concept art renderings, but also 3D models of things that we had developed um, that had a finite architecture to them. Um, we also worked quite a bit in um, foam models to figure out these cut points of where green screen would begin and, and our builds would end. Um, I think that there, what I f find kind of fascinating is more and more, this was such a huge tool of art departments for you know, large group meetings, but now more and more you have directors and DPs that um, are willing to work in a, a 3D digital environment as well. And so now a lot of the times those meetings are taking place at monitors looking at 3D models. And I ha most of the directors I, and DPs that I work with now actually take the models home, load in the camera, um, uh, um, applications and they are shot listing within those models and that is a really really fast productive way in television for us to work. Um, you know another huge tool with the handovers were um, illustrations where we would layer our concept art so that it was clear what cut points there were um, and you know I would even go so far as to add layers of set dressing, lighting, different things so that everyone was aware of who's doing what, um, what and what assets could be um, documented and reproduced in post as well. Um, this is part of the tenement portion of the back lot. And um, so again, when we talked about reusing this for different portions of the scene, um, moving those green and blue screens into different portions of the block, but then we would also, just as a strategy for the art department, we would, um, you know, the commercial level, the ground floors of the streets, we had um, massive warehouses of set dressing where we would flip it from um, kind of, uh, you know, Lower East Side Jewish district to Chinatown. Um, and so we would, when the actors were interacting on the street, we could make it feel like a completely different environment and visual effects would spend quite a bit of time um, with a second unit capturing those things so that they had them um, to use for themselves in post as well to extend the streets. Um, this was the um, kind of <laughs> the maze of the three different, the tenement, the uptown and the midtown back lots. And, um, and it was a really, you know, exciting, I mean, this was a crazy huge practical build, but it was always lacking. Um, when you have a story where you're moving around so much, I mean, we shot the hell out of this. And, um, and I think that um, it gave, it was a playground for everybody to utilize in a lot of different ways, um, but we had to heavily rely on visual effects to make it um, more um, dense and elaborate of a world to extend to. Um, the base of the Williamsburg Bridge was another you know, big build. Um, and uh, I think I'll show you in, in just a, a second here. You know, as James mentioned with the LED volume, so much of what that's offering is this interactive light quality. And when you're working with um, practical sets and blue screens, a lot, the, a, one of the big things, especially when you're working with, with night shots, is considering how light is going to be utilized in these sets and how atmosphere is going to be utilized. And when you're doing a show that takes place in 1890s New York, um, when you're just getting the benefit of electricity, um, there's, <laughs> there's a lot there to, to consider as well. And so we would go through and basically, um, it's kind of like, um, illuminated storyboards, the concept art that we were producing where it was trying to be considerate of how each step of the sequence was going to be lit. Um, and so it was a tool um, not only for posts to understand what the world beyond our, 
our physical set was, but it was a tool for set dressers and for um, for the the DP to you know say like you know the this construction site of the Williamsburg Bridge, like how the hell do we get light up there? So we added lanterns, and um, you know there were a lot of conversations about the quality of the sky and moonlight and and what would would happen. Um, but I think so much of what we do in, in our world and in our jobs, we're first and foremost the communicators of any project. And so in, by necessity, we have to be visual communicators. And so figuring out whatever way possible, at whatever scale show, um, the tools that you have in your department to bring everyone together to get as unified a finest final product as you possibly can. Um, I have a few more just examples of, of this kind of like general collaboration with visual effects, which again, it's, it's kind of primitive when you think about where we're, we're at now, but it's the, this kind of the, the blue screen world and cut points and, and set extension. But again, the, a lot of what you're doing in period work is VFX as a supporting aspect of design. Um, this was for Pachinko, another show, um, and you know, very similar in that um, place is a very dominant part of the story. Um, it's a, about a family that travels from Korea to Japan over the course of several decades and kind of how place impacts them. And um, so similar mapping and sequencing had to happen to um, kind of communicate with the visual effects department about what the world is beyond our practical sets. Um, this was also from Pachinko. There was a departure episode that just for one episode we had to do, <laughs> we had to create this entire Yokohama world um, where uh, over the course of 24 hours there was the great Kanto earthquake. And so for just one episode um, we had a tremendous amount of world building to do. And I think when you have these challenges like that where you have massive storytelling that needs to take place, you really do have to have um, a good relationship with your VFX producers and supervisors because um, the, with the pace of television, um, there's a constant kind of, I feel like we spend 80% of our time budgeting <laughs> and the other 20% just frantically trying to execute. And especially in the budgeting, a lot of the times is the back and forth between visual effects and the art department. Who can do it more effectively, more affordably, more believably? And so um, you have to have someone that you can really communicate well with. And, and I think when, you know, we've all talked quite a bit since we found out we were on this panel about um, this new frontier and how there's so much changing and there's so many things that we want to incorporate um, into the art department and engage with. And I think at the scale and the level that, that I'm talking about, the, the things that I think um, are really important for me to advocate for are to, is to get that partner in as early as possible. Because if they can be on those director scouts um, informing what's possible on their end, what's weak, what's what they're um, strengths are, what their weaknesses are, you have, an, you have an ally there so that you're immediately cutting to the quick of what's being built and what's, what, what's going to be dealt with by, by visual effects. And the, on the, the back end, and James and I don't agree on this all because I think, with, again, it's like there's different um, battles that we're fighting with the types of shows that we're working on, but on the tail end, getting advocacy from their department to have you on um, in post, in, in non-consecutive um, days where you're basically working as a consultant, but you're helping steer it in a way that's controlled just as much as you are on the day-to-day -day during production. And so I think that, um, you know, there's so many students here, and it's such an exciting thing, and there's so many things that I wish I would have heard coming up, and I think that um, my big kind of message to everybody is is just, I think visual effects can be really intimidating, um, 
uh, and because in it, and for a long time it's it's been kept in this kind of separate world. It's something that's done later, and I think the best thing that we can do is um, advocate for control of, over these things in in collaborate with these people as best we can in order to ensure that the the vision is um, fulfilled. And um, you know the the final thing I, the, I just finished um, the first season of Interview with the Vampire, and this was another backlot that we did um, in New Orleans. And, you know, it was very similar to the alienist in a lot of ways, where you're extending a, a very real physical part of a city. Um, and, um, yeah, I think there's a lot, a lot of what you've seen is a little redundant, because I think with this, the supporting role of visual effects, there's a lot of, um, again, it feel, the technology feels a little antiquated. Um, but I think it's something that more co is more common for most of us in our careers. Um, and again, I think, uh, you know, I think that when you're talking about sets where you, we've all had to deal with these before, where you have, um, you know, stage sets where you need to have physical environments out the windows and, um, it can be real hit or miss with translates or, or other things. And um, I think on interview, we really wanted a believable world at the window. We couldn't afford the LED screens. And so um, what we ended up doing was doing a green screen out the window so that we, could, we would have the option for, for interactive light and for kind of some control over horizon line issues. Um, we did that for the night scenes, but we used a um, soft drop for the day scenes. And if you watch the show, to me it's painfully obvious which is which. Um, and I think that, you know, again, these are, par these are part of the, um, when we, the battles that we need to know to fight for, because um, when you see the final show and you have those moments of like, oh shit, like what the hell is that? Um, when you, when you, and you're like, what could I have done differently? And I think that I wish we would have fought harder to have green screen out the windows the entire time instead of using the soft backing because there's just, there's so many scenes and it just falls apart when actors move around and there's, there's issues with that. So um, I'm, I'm ending with this as to remind myself of, how we have to keep fighting every day for these things. Um, and yeah, I think um, just know that you have power. You have um, uh, you, agency in these conversations and to engage yourself as much as you possibly can. Amazing, thank you so much for showing us your beautiful work. Um, I think we don't really have time for audience questions. So I'm just gonna ask one last question to um, the panelists and anybody that wants to talk to them later is welcome to. Um, but I guess I'm just, uh, I wanted to uh, be the voice of people in the room that perhaps are really just going through their first experiences in VFX and possibly this is mind-blowing to them and um, it's kind of hard to know where to start from. I, I'm sure you all started in the same place. So I know you've already voiced a lot of kind of words of advice, but if, it, it, if there's a little bit more or like one piece of advice that you can give to someone who's about to just embark on their first VFX collaboration. No, okay, go on, go on. Yeah. Um, I think that it's intimidating, the idea of touching, you know, I mean, interacting with something that's not actually on your set, but I think it's, it should feel, I guess I would just say it comes back to tools, you know, I think it's just remembering that it's just another tool in our quiver, and like we're often asked to deliver more set than we can build. And um, so just um, considering that our space and, and using the, I mean, I had interesting conversations with designers who are doing it all in SketchUp, you know, and I know that there are 
plugins, you know, I mean, the models you're sharing with your DP, are they SketchUp models? Yeah. So, I mean, there's like VR plugins for SketchUp that you can use that are really fluid and simple, you know, whether you, VR is something you want to play with. But I think you can, in a crude wireframe, you can really describe a massive amount of space. And I would just say to something you said, Mara, like, I mean, I respect how different our worlds are and like, I don't mean to um, suggest that like, uh, you should be doing anything differently. I mean, everything you're doing is incredible. I find that like, that the post line, like when we finish production, we're done. And if they promise you time in post, often that doesn't happen, you know? So, so I think like, I'm just advocating I, I, for understanding that I've, I think it's amazing that your DP and directors are actually taking those models and playing with them. And I think that's the kind of like infection that I'm like excited about where it's like, where if we can show the people that we're working for and with, you know, the way of these digital tools, I think more and more people are gonna expect it, that it's just like part of our process at whatever scale it is, on a simple SketchUp model or, or like a fully realized Unreal project, like I think people are just gonna expect that they can have it and we should keep pushing for that. Like when you are standing on set at, and you know, with the blue screen at the end of the street, I mean, it's possible right now to get an iPad and pop your SketchUp model into it and like actually show the director there what it is or ask the visual effects people to put it on the switcher, at which point they'll say, yeah, that's cool, but I wish I could see more in the model. And that kind of question means that visual effects is gonna be expected to deliver more in prep. You know, and I think like you're busy, they're less busy in prep, and they should be doing they should be doing it na then while you're there and checking in with you. You know what I mean? I to whatever degree they can. You know. Yeah, um, I agree. Um, I I would say um, my advice to start with um, is knowledge. Knowledge is the key. Um, to, um, um, to, to, to have control or to, to be on the playground. You, you know, you know, you have to know how to use these tools and um, you don't have to be, you know, more than an ex, you know, don't have to, to know everything, but, you know, don't be afraid to, 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 to ask and uh, to get involved. And normally when I come into a project and I see there's quite a bit of VFX involved, my first question in a meeting is, who is the VFX supervisor? Who is my partner here? And very often, um, or at least in the last two shows, there was no VFX supervisor, and so I could make a suggestion from someone that I know, and I know there's a collaboration already established, and that helped me a lot. And um, the, the second thing is, which um, is very helpful, um, whatever means you use, is it a SketchUp model or a physical model or a good concepts, do as much previous as you can do and make sure they don't lose it on the long way. Because so I, I very often go to sets if there's a blue screen and we don't have the technical possibilities to show the director how it's going to look like. I just print it out this size and I put it next to the camera. And I always make sure it's it's it sticks there so that it keeps, you know, that it's it's you know it's in the in the mind of the director and the DP and then they won't lose it. This was the way I mostly did it. Uh, I feel like I said a lot of things, but um, I think, I guess my final note on it would be, um, and what is so amazing about this is, um, I think um, when I was coming up, sometimes art departments felt like very competitive places with set designing and art directing, um, and there wasn't a lot of communication amongst ourselves because I, I'm, I'm not sure where that was coming from um, exactly, but I've, I've found that over the course of the 20 years I've been working that there's been a much more, um, or there's been a, a focused attempt to be more communicative about rate, about you know what people are making, how long people are working, you know, uh, what you're doing. And I would say, um, you know, I hope that we're moving towards a trend where we can all 
support each other. And, um, and I think that part of this new frontier with the technology that's coming is um, one of the best things we can do when faced with this intimidation is to reach out to folks that have done it before and to use each other as allies in, um, in education and in um, uh, liaising with the, the experts that people have, have utilized. Um, I think that, you know, I hope we're moving to a phase of things where um, we can do more things like this and it opens the door to that communication so that instead of being, you know, I think production designing can be a really lonely, um, daunting thing because you have a, the weight of so much on your shoulders. And if we can move into a, a phase of things where making a phone call is a real easy um, thing to do and you don't have to feel threatened because you don't know the answer to it. I think it's like, none of us know everything. You know, a lot of us know very little. Um, and so I think let, let's, let's use each other. Let's, let's be allies. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Great words to end the panel with.